any game with the word dragon in the title will most likely grab my attention. If that title has a sword through it on the game's title screen, I'm definitely going to be intrigued. Dragon Buster 2 has both going for it, but it unfortunately doesn't have much else. Maybe that's a little harsh, and I'll get into the specifics of course, but this definitely has the feel of a poor man's Zelda with some dungeon crawly elements sprinkled on. And I mean, really poor, like as if Link only had one weapon and dungeon maps and overworld screens repeated themselves. It wasn't uncommon for developers around this time to look at other great successful titles and copy paste a few things. The more memorable Zelda ripoffs we remember, Battle of Olympus and Star Tropics, are easy go-tos as examples. Dragon Buster 2 Yami no Fuin, the subtitle roughly translating to Seal of Darkness, was released in 1989 as a Japan exclusive prequel to the 1984 Famicom title Dragon Buster. In Dragon Buster 2, you play as a hero named Carl, a dragon slayer who wields a bow and arrow. Carl must pass through six stages and reach the Dragon Castle to retrieve the sword which the original Dragon Buster, Clovis, will use as a weapon. Each of the six levels has a mountain that the player must reach to progress. To reach this mountain, you have to carve your way through different locations on the map. When you first start out, you're presented with a screen that shows items that may be useful to you in the area. Items such as a tomahawk to clear forests or a camel to traverse deserts. These are one-time use items that are given as random pickups for defeating dungeons. They're similar to the hammer and the cloud items in Super Mario Bros. 3. You'll notice a few different icons on the overworld map. These represent dungeons and can be entered by pressing select near the dungeon's icon. Once inside, the player has two tasks. Find a key dropped by monsters, and locate an exit to make your way back to the overworld map. Finished dungeons disappear from the map, clearing the way for the hero to progress. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of dungeons on the map for which the player must progress through. This is where the game really loses its luster. The dungeons are repetitive, and by repetitive, I mean exact duplicates. After you've gone through your first few dungeons and completed the first world, without knowing it yet, you've literally already experienced almost all of the game. And I'm not just talking about dungeon layouts, but also monster spawn points, key locations, and exit doors as well. As you become aware of the same dungeons being repeated over and over, you quickly become less interested in the game. The feeling of exploration evaporates fast. Like, imagine if in Zelda, rather than having 9 amazing dungeons, there were 50 dungeons that were all variants of the same 4 layouts, which repeat the same few screen patterns. I know that limitations in memory only allow for so much to fit, but to fill out a game with repetitive junk just to extend gameplay doesn't make it better. Super Mario Bros. takes 10 minutes to beat and it's still amazing. And that's because Miyamoto never said, hey, we can fit more in here if we just repeat World 1 50 times. Instead, he said, let's have 8 worlds, all with distinctly different levels. This wasn't Donkey Kong, this was Super Mario Bros. The innovation of level progression had been made, and if Miyamoto innovated this in 85 with things like Mario and Zelda, why didn't these guys know it in 89? It's this one thing that really drags the game down. How can you have an exploratory game in 1989 that has you feeling like you aren't exploring? Like, this game looks cool, but I sure have been in this dungeon a lot of times. And it's a shame too, because there's actually a few neat things that this game does. Like the fact that rather than having a health meter, Carl changes colors based on how many times he's been hit. Or the way that his arrows can bounce off walls to hit enemies around corners, or even bounce back to hit himself if not careful. But the gameplay features aren't enough to save this game from its design in my opinion. Not for the time it was released. If this was released 5-10 to ten years prior, it probably would have been revered as a classic, but when this title, which closer resembled Tower of Jurago, was released, a link to the past had already started development. So the type of shortcuts this game uses in its programming just doesn't fly in my book. Most games by this point in the Famicom's life cycle were beginning to stretch the bounds of the system, not reach backwards. If you're a kid who doesn't know any better, or maybe even someone who isn't informed on the progression of early video game development and you play this, you may think it's neat. But knowing what other games were out at the same time as this, you probably know why this game would have been in the clearance bin.